Welcome to Rask's Australian Business Podcast, a series for entrepreneurs who dare to leave the world in a better place and get paid while we do it. This podcast will make you a better business owner, investor, founder, or entrepreneur. If you want to start a business or already have one, please subscribe to the series or share it with your friends, business partner, or colleagues. And don't forget to consider taking our free business course, which includes heaps of templates for creating business plans, HR documents, employee files, all of my software recommendations, and more. The course is completely free and available via the link in your podcast player. Okay, let's get into the episode. For the first 12 episodes of the Australian Business Podcast, which coincide with the lessons in the free business course, I'm going to take you through the essentials of running a small business in Australia or how to start one. But for this episode, I figured it'd be worth introducing you to me and the business that I've created. So it adds some context to where I come from and how I tackle some of the problems that I have faced. As of mid to late 2022, Rask is a pretty well-known brand around Australia, especially amongst investors and financial professionals. We have around 17,000 students, 4,000 or more paying members, and hundreds of thousands of listeners, viewers, or readers across our websites and podcasts. We've also formed partnerships with some of Australia's and the world's biggest financial brands. From the outside, things are looking like they're going great, but on the inside, it's a totally different story. Like all small businesses, my journey with Rask has been filled with huge amounts of personal sacrifice, financial investment, stress, and responsibility. Indeed, like all small businesses, I spend every day, not just my 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, worried about changes in our industry, competition, partners, customers, and team members. Why? As a small business owner, I am responsible for everything. Rask officially started life in 2017 from the front room of my partner's parents' house. I had a Mac, an Officeworks caramel colored fake timber desk, and a vision of what we wanted to do. However, planning and thinking about what the business would be started many years before the official launch. Broadly, I've divided Rask's journey into four stages. The first stage is the preparation stage. While preparing for Rask, I was working in the industry, but I was also studying my ass off and saving my ass off. And like many young people, I had people in my life who dreamed of being an quote unquote entrepreneur, but weren't prepared to put in the work, which starts with spending years, I think, of long days becoming a subject matter expert. I knew that if anyone was going to take a young financial entrepreneur seriously, I had to be the expert. I needed master's degrees, industry recognition, and so on. This is especially important in finance because money is such an emotional and sensitive issue, and I was young. During the preparation stage, I identified three of the biggest risks to the success of Rask following months of research. The first one is quite technical. It's getting into Google News for our Rask Media News website. This is quite a technical thing, and only a few people in Australia understood this at the time. When I launched Rask, I'd say 99% of Australia accessed their investing news through Google. And the thing that ranks at the top of Google news feeds is Google News. But only high quality and technically optimized websites can get into this special feed inside Google. Given my tech background and experience, I knew what I needed to do, though there were no guarantees it would happen. And I knew it would lead to massive gains in customer acquisition, that is, customers finding Rask websites. Achieving this was like getting 500 free kicks in a game of football. The second big risk that I knew I needed to overcome for Rask to be a success, and the biggest hurdle in finance overall, was getting licensed. In Australia, everyone who gives financial advice needs to operate under a license. It's the same type of thing in the construction industry. You could be the best carpenter in the world, but you won't legally be able to build a house without having your building license, or at least acting underneath one. The licensing body in Australia is ASIC, and they publish hundreds of these boring regulatory guides. Think of the driest thing you've ever read, then think drier. But here's the rub. I knew the ASIC regulatory guides better than compliance experts and most of the lawyers I came across. It's no joke because I have over 1500 pages printed off with heaps of highlights, tabs, 
and pages of notes for every single one of the licensing guides. Number three, offering a membership. Shortly after RAS started, I planned for us to make money by offering memberships to our premium material. For example, we would offer our best research or investment recommendations to content for $400. However, I knew I couldn't make money from these memberships until I had the news, that is a large customer base, and the ability to offer financial advice, that is the licensing. So my biggest risk of all was actually monetizing the business relied on my other two risks being overcome. While I was preparing and researching, I was working two to three days a week in a contractor capacity and I was earning really good money. While I was also studying and preparing for what RASC would become, I ask you, what are the three biggest risks in your business plan? How will you overcome or manage them? The next stage is what I call the inception stage. Here, we had no revenue, just a well thought out idea. In the beginning, I was the only full timer and I was lucky enough to get eight hours a week or thereabouts from Sophie, our designer. She was and is an absolute all-star designer, winning the ducks of her university. I really lucked out. Rask started out creating educational videos on YouTube and on our website. I met everyone who would accept a free coffee, and I mean everyone. If they were in finance or a business owner, it was a bonus. I could see that financial literacy and investment literacy was a big issue, but there was no legitimate solution. My plan of creating educational material was in motion, but I was firmly in the quote unquote, get information mode, learning as much as I could from everyone who knew anything. I should also mention that even though we weren't earning any meaningful revenue, running the business was still very expensive. I was paying, I guess, around $40,000 per year in legal insurance and licensing alone, long before I had $40,000 in revenue. I was still using MailChimp to collect email subscribers. And that's kind of an inside joke because my belief is everyone starts with MailChimp and then realizes how bad it is. But maybe it's got a lot better since I used it. At this stage, I would measure our success and get positive feedback loops by the number of video views, website visitors, and newsletter captures. I had invested tens of thousands of dollars, secured around $20,000 of cash from investors, and taken on a $120,000 loan from a family member. Yet I was still not generating any meaningful revenue. The next stage is what I call traction. And this is probably from years one to three. In the early years, I worked from home most of the time. But a few years into the journey, I needed to escape my living room and be amongst people. Side note, I find it's unhealthy to work in the same place you live your life. It breaks down the healthy barrier between work life and home life. By this time, I had a couple of contractors who worked on a freelance basis and Sophie. Then Catherine, at the time a university student, came in for two days per week as a junior analyst working on our memberships and as an editor working on the news websites. She was my first real employee. Sally came on as a contractor for videography. Around this time, Kate, who is now my co-host on the Australian Finance Podcast, and I had met over a cup of coffee through Twitter, of all places, and we launched Rask's second podcast series, the Australian Finance Podcast. Given Kate had a full-time job, we did this outside of work hours from 6 to 9 p.m. on a weekday. Towards the end of this period, we worked from a room we had hired in an office in Hawthorne. I paid $1,000 per month and we squeezed four people in there. It wasn't glamorous, but the people were great and it worked well. Co-working spaces would have cost twice as much for half the space. Here's a fun fact. I believe it would have been far quicker and easier for me and my partner to save and generate $1 million in net worth by not starting our business. There are so many benefits to running your own business, but it's important to remember it does come at a huge cost. By this time, I was already well established in my profession as a financial analyst. I'd had five years of industry experience, two master's degrees, and many years of equivalent learning by reading and research. However, this was only the beginning of what I later phrased as a quote unquote specialist generalist. Like all small business owners, I learned to do everything from anyone who would teach me. YouTube, Khan Academy, randoms, anyone. I had never recorded and edited a podcast just like this one, let alone created a YouTube channel, paid super, hired someone remotely, learned how to code a WordPress website and so on. Joe Mager, a former colleague at The Motley Fool and a friend put me onto podcasts from the US 
and suggested I could do it in Australia, so I did. I learned how to record interviews, make and mix audio files, and now we have two of Australia's biggest business podcasts. At this stage of our journey, I was measuring our success by the number of high-profile guests we were getting on our podcasts, and the number of website visitors who turned into email subscribers, and finally, by the number of paying members. We were consistently getting 150,000 monthly website visitors because I managed to crack into Google. Adding thousands of newsletter readers and a handful of paying new subscribers every month. Around this time, I raised $100,000 by selling 20% of my business. My biggest investor, who trusted me, said, I don't know how you got to the valuation, but I trust you. $100,000 for 20% would mean the entire business, or 100%, was worth $500,000. That's how valuations in startups work. At this stage, I would write a monthly newsletter to my shareholders, summarizing our achievements and my plans. They would give me lots of praise and encouragement and share some feedback. This exercise of writing a monthly newsletter was extremely important because it pulled me away from the tools and from the action and required me to reflect and to think smarter. In other words, I was working on the business, not in the business. I would encourage you to incorporate this idea into your business. Towards the end of this period, we faced our first existential crisis. We went from 7 to 10 employees and contractors to just one, myself. After the license we operated underneath failed to secure the necessary insurance to keep the license active. I was given about 48 hours notice, and it meant my business would be illegal in providing advice in just a matter of hours. So I immediately began to plan to remove all of my staff, cut my wage, calculated how much I would have to pay back our members, and began to cut costs in every part of the business. This was a very dark time for me. It got so bad that I received a phone call when I was in my apartment in Hawthorne one day. I was at my wit's end and I didn't know what to do. The voice sounded familiar. It was Scott Pape, the barefoot investor, who had given me a call during my time of crisis. On reflection, I feel like this period changed my life. It gave me even more of a wired and anxious feeling about how fragile this company could be, and I ended up giving more of myself to it than I probably should have. It was the opposite of what I should have been doing. Ultimately, this setback probably cost me about a year and resulted in me and my shareholders giving up more than 20% of the company to be rescued. However, it also brought with it a great partner in my business. The next period I call the inflection period, and this is from about three years until now. At the start of this period, we were bringing in about $150,000 in annual income but I was consistently losing about $60,000 on the bottom line, meaning I was spending about $210,000 just to keep the lights on. During this time, I did not take a consistent wage. In fact, I didn't take a consistent wage for, I'm guessing, about four years. I estimate up until this point, I had invested $300,000 and incurred lost wages that I could have earned somewhere else of an additional $450,000. Over these past couple of years, I've realized a few things. First, we took way too long to figure out what works. I mean, what really works. Not just what I thought was working. We have so many good things going for us at Rask. We are very blessed. But I didn't truly understand our value proposition. Were we a news and publication website? Or an educational business? A membership site? An investment service? We inevitably got to the bottom of these answers by A, going on a retreat, and B, following the money. We realized we could have 100 members at $199, or 3,000 at $99. Product market fit is so important. Second, I overcapitalized on growth. I'll talk about the dangers of overcapitalization later in the podcast and in the course. During COVID, things were flying at Rask. The world was stuck at home and looking to learn about the stock market. It was the perfect storm for us. 
we were on track to make more than $1 million in subscription revenue alone, plus income from other parts of our business. The only problem? I spent about $1.2 million to capture this growth and be ready for the growth that would continue into the future. But then the economy and financial markets decided to go in the other direction. People were no longer wanting to learn about the stock market because the stock market was volatile. At the same time, I realized that although this part of our business was growing rapidly, it wasn't where I wanted to take the business longer term. I went backwards from eight employees and three contractors to two employees and me. It was far harder to do this time around because this time the decision was completely on my shoulders. While I've learned that business is business, these people were my friends. I vowed to never be in this position again. I would add a side note here. As a business owner with employees, you will feel responsible for them. While it may not be entirely accurate, you will most likely feel responsible for their livelihoods and their families. So you've got to ask yourself, are you prepared for this responsibility? The third thing that I learned during this period was that the success of our brand crept up on me far quicker than I had anticipated. I went from saying yes to every opportunity and every coffee catch up in front of me to saying no to probably 99% of things that come my way. We could do this or that or this. But maybe we don't need to or want to. Even this course and the business podcast took me over a year to get started. I could have done it sooner for sure, but I had other priorities. A quote, overnight success in six years, end quote, is the saying that aptly describes our situation. Rask today. As of 2022, we have signed partnerships with some of Australia's biggest and emerging brands, run two of Australia's biggest podcasts, have nearly 17,000 students, over 4,000 members, and tens of thousands of readers. I expect our business will be capable of generating millions of dollars in revenue over the next few years, provided we keep focused and smart about where we grow, what we focus on, and scale accordingly. As you'll discover in our quick lesson on accounting and cash flow, which is one of the episodes and lessons in this course, revenue, sometimes called turnover, doesn't tell the full picture. $1 million of revenue for us, being an online business, is far more valuable than $1 million of revenue for a construction business, where the profit margins are maybe closer to 10 or 20%. As we have grown, I've been approached by businesses asking me if we would sell the business which is a compliment. But I often ask myself, if I sell Rask, then what happens? I'm finally at a stage where we are helping more people and the business is finally starting to work for me. For me, after six years, I'm finally able to take a decent wage and soon, I hope, begin repaying our shareholders and investors with some hefty dividends. Thanks for listening to my story with Rask. I'm sure I'll update this podcast in time. If you're listening to this podcast series for the first time, please don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to take or enroll in our business course. Throughout this initial 12 part series and in our course, I'll share some examples and anecdotes with you. As you'll recognize, I do not have all of the answers, far from it. I'm still working on getting better, but I hope I can share some of my years of lessons learned, what I've learned from interviewing some of Australia's best CEOs my finance background, what I've learned from investing in many great companies, and from working alongside heaps of talented people. If you want to help me out with the course or the podcast, right now the best thing you can do is subscribe and review this podcast in Apple or Spotify. Don't forget to please ask me a question. You can do that by heading to any of the Rask websites. You'll find a link in the menu that says ask a question, and you can leave your reviews in Apple Podcasts. That's enough about my business. In the next episodes, we're going to tackle the foundations of starting a business, starting with the big ideas and the cold realities. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Business Podcast. I think this series is best served with my free business course on Rask Education. My free course includes all of my notes, templates, employment guides, legal documents, marketing strategies, software recommendation, and ideas for starting and running a small business. If you're a small business owner or an expert like an accountant, 
lawyer, investor, or entrepreneur, I want to hear from you. I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do with this podcast series, so I'm looking for sponsors, as well as potential co-hosts, and of course, I'm eager to invest in businesses run by talented people. If you're looking for a supporter or advisor, a silent partner, or even an investor to support your growth, I can help. Please contact me via the RASC website. Finally, if this podcast or the course helps you, I only ask that you please help me by sharing it with one friend, colleague, or family member who runs a business. Thanks for listening.